Hello, let's try this again. Uh, computer just ate the first lecture. So this will be in two parts, uh, probably about 15 minutes each video. And I'm going to have some other things for you as well. Um, first thing, I just want to say I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to look at your discussion post yet. It's been a really long week. Uh, I had computer problems, one laptop fried. This laptop's obviously giving me trouble today. Uh, so I plan to look at those tomorrow. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about that I don't think I've talked about before is historical relativism. And that goes to why we discuss history. Well, why do we study history? Is it just to study history, to look at the past? I think that's cool. But historical relativism says that it has to have something to do with us. We should be able to learn from the past, relate it to today in some way. So what I want you to do is look at these events of the past and see how they're similar to today. That's one reason we do the discussion boards in the hopes that, um, you know, I leave it vague so you can kind of go into different directions like that. So uh, historical relativism means what does it tell us about today, to help us in the present, to plan for the future. Now, what we're going to look at today, and I apologize for being so hoarse, uh, not feeling too great, so that's going on too. And having to redo two lectures tonight is kind of a pain. So one thing we begin to see, and we saw more and more people coming into the uh, colonies last time, we begin to see something called Angloniza Anglo Anglonization. Basically, this is the colonies, especially the colonists, especially the rich ones, trying to out-British the British. But at the same time, you have something uniquely American being created. Uh, one of the status symbols of the time was actually the pineapple, not only to eat, but actually showed up in architecture as well. Uh, that's why, why it was always in those episodes of Psych. Um, we continue to see strong assemblies and weaker governors. Uh, sometimes politics would get very nasty in the colonies. Uh, here's an example from uh, 1709. Uh, this is about Lord Cornberry, uh, who Massachusetts, I believe. Uh, he was not very popular with some people, so someone wrote an anon anonymous letter that said, my Lord Cornberry has and doth still make use of an unfortunate custom of dressing himself in women's clothes and exposing himself in, the gar in that garb upon the ramparts in the view of the public. In that dress, he draws a world of spectators about him and consequently as many censures. So what they're trying to do is basically destroy his career. So if you think stuff gets nasty today, well, it got pretty nasty then. Um, but we also began to see complaints about a lack of representation, especially within the British Parliament, though the Parliament under the Whigs would argue that, well, you have virtual representation because everyone in Parliament is worried about the entire empire. Now, to not have representation was not a strange thing at all uh, because boroughs in the Parliament were based on history, and you actually had parts of Great Britain that had sprung up that didn't really have much representation at all. Actually, one district had a represent representative, and it was underwater. So there's that. Um, this is also the time of the Enlightenment. Uh, James Oglethorpe will create the colony of Georgia, built at first as a defensive barrier for against the Spanish in the south. In fact, the city of Savannah is actually made up as a defensive city, if you've ever been there. I have it, but I'm told it's beautiful. Um, what this was was an experiment. It was a second chance place for convicts and other people. Uh, in Georgia, they actually banned the importation of slaves and alcohol. Uh, obviously, this experiment doesn't last very long, but the idea was to give people a second chance. Uh, the best example of the Enlightenment in America is Ben Franklin with his inventions and some weird stuff that he's into. Um, and so, you know, he shows why his science is important. Um, another thing that kind of is during the Great Enlightenment is not all of our founding fathers were Christians. 
many subscribe to a belief known as deism. And the most famous deist was Thomas Jefferson. Uh, basically, the idea is you believe in a god, but you believe that, much like a clockmaker, uh, God created the universe, he set it with natural laws, started it, and then let it go. Like, uh, you know, a clockmaker starts the clock, and then he's done with it, mostly. Uh, so you actually have people who believe in deism. This is also the time of the Great Awakening, so we have a change in religion as well. Um, Gilbert Tennant argued against what he called an empty, dead form of religion. He said, only by accepting the reality of sin and opening one heart to grace could one hope to achieve salvation. Uh, Tennant also took aim at the America, America's expanding consumer society and said that we were coveting too many things. So he was worried about materialism. Now, the main kind of guy of this movement, though, is Jonathan Edwards. Not the guy who ran for vice president many years ago before you were born, probably. Uh, not the guy that talks to dead people, allegedly. He doesn't. But he was a minister. And what I will do is I will include either a link to this or hopefully a video. Usually I read this to you, a part of it. Uh, but Jonathan Edwards is the leading minister of the time. He is best known, he, you can actually find all of his sermons, but he, most of his sermons, but he's best known for sinners in the hands of an angry God, which as I said, I will include, but it is very much fire and brimstone bringing into the church, basically saying God loves you, but he's, he hates you and he will kill you if you don't behave, uh, which I guess works for some people, not me personally, but some people seem to do that. Uh, the Great Awakening will give a voice to women and minorities within the movement, uh, even some Native American preachers and African American preachers. Uh, we will also see the Indian Revival Movement during this time, which was an attempt to move away from the influence of the white man. Uh, obviously, it wasn't too successful, but uh, white influence was very bad for Native Americans. Uh, alcohol was catastrophic. Uh. So what I want to do next is kind of do a brief tour of the colonies, kind of tell you what they were like, and then we'll kind of move on to some other stuff. Um, in the upper and lower south, you had slavery. In the 1730s, you had the creation of North and South Carolina. They were split. The lower south had larger cultivation, which meant that, you know, they needed more labor, which meant more slaves. Now, from time to time, slaves will resist. Uh, 1739, you had the Stono Rebellion. What they wanted to do was to overthrow their plantations and escape to Spanish Florida. The idea was they would add slaves as they went. Though going to Florida is not too helpful because the Spanish had slavery too. Uh, it did not work. Uh, what we will see in the South is the beginnings of a unique African-American culture that will emerge a fusion of being in North America and what they remember from Africa. Uh, it's a very beautiful culture. Beautiful music will come out of that. Uh, the next area, New England, home of the cheating Tom Brady, or used to be anyway. Um, it was the most ethnically homogenous, so, you know, just regular old white people. Uh, they were white and English. They belonged to congregational churches. Uh, trade and the sea were very important. Uh, so basically, they made their money off of commerce. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic, New Jersey, that area, Pennsylvania, was the most diverse. It had different types of white people. Uh, the merchant class was the most influential. And since it includes New Jersey, it'll be no surprise that they were the slowest to create colleges. Uh, you actually have a lot of colleges that will emerge as a result of the Great Awakening and be tied to the new religions of that. Um, in the South, as we've mentioned, they're tied to slavery. We also have the back country, basically where we live, uh, where people came across the mountains. It lacked the basic structures of other areas, and there were often strained relations with Native Americans. Uh, there were some cities at this time, 
One uh, tenth of the people lived in cities. Philadelphia was the largest city with 35,000. New York had a population of 20,000. Taverns were probably the most important uh, part of the city. It was basically where people came to meet. You would get your mail there. You know, it's the center of the community. In fact, to be a tavern keeper, you had to prove that you were a good person of morality. So, you know, you had to be, you had to basically pass, uh, you had to be vetted basically to be a tavern keeper. Uh, now I do want to talk about, I told you I'd talk about the French this time. Uh, New France was settled in 1605, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Port Royal in Acadia up in Canada. They were governed by a trading company until 1635. Uh, it was based on the fur trade with Indians. In 1627, they said only Catholics could come, which meant there would be fewer uh, Frenchmen in the New World. Uh, they had to befriend the Native Americans. Uh, in 1663, Louis XIV made it a royal colony, the Sun King. He sent uh, soldiers and women. They were called the king's wives so that the population would expand. It will grow from 4,000 to 16, in 1665 to 15,000 in 1690. By 1750, it's 70,000. Uh, compared to the British, the British have one point the the British have 1.5 million people. Uh, I hope the video didn't mess up there. Um, in 1682, a man named Rene Robert Cavalier. Uh, went down to the Great Lakes, down the Mississippi River, claiming the Ohio and Mississippi Valleys for France, and they began to settle the area in 1699. In 1718, they founded the city of New Orleans, which would be very important. Uh, so we'll get back to the French a little bit later. Let's talk about the British system. Truth be told, the colonists had some freedoms that were not found in Great Britain the elected legislatures being one of them. But as I mentioned before, they had no representation in parliament. Um, only males with property could vote. Colonial legislatures will get more and more powerful over time. Now, what we're going to see is a tension between the British and the colonists they are trying to rule uh, through a series of laws. Um, now, we're going to start with uh, Navigation Act of 1651, then we're going to go back a little bit for the Molasses Act later. Uh, in 1651, um, the British wanted to increase colonial revenue, and so they passed a law that said imports and exports could only be sent on British ships. Uh, this was basically done to hurt the Dutch, and it hurts the colonists as well because it cuts down on their commerce. In 1652, the British and Dutch will go to war, fighting three naval conflicts from 1652 to 1674. In 1660, they will pass the Navigation Act, which said certain products like tobacco could only be shipped on British ships and only to Great Britain uh, where and nowhere else in Europe. Uh, all shipments had to go through Great Britain, offloaded and taxed. Obviously, colonists would not like that very much. Uh, colonists very much resented that. Now, what I want to talk about next is I want to take a step back um, and really kind of look at what's going on in Europe and how it impacts North America. Because, you know, things don't happen in isolation. So, from 1750 to 1740, Europe is mostly at peace. But in 1740, conflict will, will erupt with a war called the War of Austrian Secession, which will last from 1740 to 1748. Charles VI was the ruler of Austria. He was concerned that he did not have a male heir. And he made arrangements with other world leaders, European leaders, to recognize his daughter Maria Theresa as the legitimate ruler. So Charles is able to die happy knowing that he set his daughter up. Well, basically, after he dies, the agreements are largely ignored. Uh, Frederick II of Prussia took advantage by taking the, the area known as Silesia. 
France also entered the conflict against Austria. So Maria Theresa is forced to make an alliance with the one area, one country that will always fight the French, Great Britain. Uh, France will occupy the Austrian Netherlands, right above France, actually. The Netherlands basically are owned by everybody at some point. Uh, France will also take Madras in India from Great Britain. In North America, the British will capture the French fortress of Loisburg at the entrance of the St. Lawrence River. By 1748, war had taken its toll on all of its combatants. The peace treaty of Old La Chapelle will uh, end the war with a promise to return all occupied territory except for Silesia. Aus uh, Prussia refused. This will ignite a next war. Uh, that next war will be very important for North America. It's going to be called the Seven Years' War in Europe. Uh, this is actually a good spot to end the first video. We'll talk about the Seven Years' War here in the